If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of James. James. Yeah, that's right. Um, we've probably all been to the doctor's office. You have one of these uh, seat in, your, in your chair there. When we were told to open our mouth while the doctor had uh, depressed our tongue with this wooden stick and then instructed us to say what? Ah, uh, yeah, nearly all of us. Uh, even when we didn't have a sore throat, that's what always amazed me. But apparently, there's a lot of things that they're looking for when they take that quick glance into our mouth. What is the color of our tongue? Are there any sores or lesions on our tongue? Is there anything unusual with the movement in the roof of our mouth? Is our uvula, that piece of skin that kind of hangs down there in the middle of our throat, is it in the position where it normally should be? How do our teeth look? Is there an abscess on our gums anywhere? Is there any swelling underneath our tongue? All of that in a matter of what? Two or three seconds that they are looking for. It's amazing how much a a trained physician can tell about our physical condition in such a short, brief time by simply looking at our tongue in our mouth. What's true physically? is also true spiritually. The Bible tells us that the words which come out of our mouth tell a lot about the thoughts residing in our heart. The words we say and how we say those words are a remarkably accurate indication of our spiritual condition. How many of you were able to make the time to read five chapters of James? Can I see your hands? Raise them up, raise them up. Listen, we got one week left, you guys. Next week is our last week in the book of James. So there's five chapters in James. That's less than one chapter a day. I want to encourage all of you to do that this week. Now, if you've missed any of these messages in the series, take the time to go to the website and watch them because James is so practical, so helpful in the things that he shares with us on how we should live our daily lives. We've learned in this sermon series that for every action, there is a natural and there is a logical reaction. So every time that we speak, there's going to be a reaction to what we've said. Sometimes what we say is good, and the reaction is favorable. Sometimes what we say is not so good, and the reaction is not so favorable. Do you know that many people in South Korea are getting operations on their tongues, have nothing to do with their their medical health? Apparently, there is a procedure that, that snips some of that thin tissue under the tongue, enabling South Koreans to say their L and their R sounds like Americans. Why would they want to do that? Because they are such a a technologically advanced, booming economy that it is uh, a benefit for anyone, according to the South Korean businesses, if they can sound more like an American. Share that at work tomorrow, huh? That's good stuff right there. The reality is this, we all need an operation on our tongue, and it has very little to do with our L and our R sounds. James is going to tell us um, that God wants us to use our tongues and our words as he intended to build people up rather than tear people down. So. If you have your Bibles, we're going to kind of breeze through various parts of uh, James here because he talks about this issue several different times. Let's start with chapter 1, verse 19. Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters, you must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. So get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts, for it has the power to save your souls. Verse 26, if you claim to be religious but don't control your tongue, 
You are fooling yourself, and your religion is worthless. Chapter 3, verse 1. Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church, for we who teach will be judged more strictly. Indeed, we all make many mistakes, for if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. Why, we can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. And a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches. But a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire, and the tongue is a flame of fire. It's a whole world of wickedness corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. People can tame all kinds of animals and birds and reptiles and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this isn't right. Does a spring of water bubble out with both fresh water and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives or a grapevine produce figs? No, and you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. Chapter 5, verse 16. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Verse 19. My dear brothers and sisters, if someone among you wanders away from the truth and is brought back, you can be sure that whoever brings the sinner back will save that person from death and bring about the forgiveness of many sins. So turn uh, your bulletins over there to the back, and uh, let's fill that out. James talks, first of all, here in these verses that we read about the importance of the tongue. The average male tongue weighs about 70 grams, two and a half ounces. The average female tongue weighs about 60 grams. What I'm saying is now we know why females can talk faster and, and longer. I may be retiring sooner than I thought. After. <laughs> While the tongue is best known for making noises, sometimes not always good noises, it is the strongest muscle of the human body. It can lift uh, things up to 80 times its weight. So even though it's small, it is a, a powerful part of our body. And because of what the tongue says and the impact of what the tongue has, the proverb writer tells us the tongue has the power of life and death. That's a huge statement. Jesus tells us a tree is recognized by the type of fruit that it produces. A pear tree is going to have pears on it. A cherry tree produces cherries. And likewise, because the words that come out of our mouth originate in a person's heart, Jesus says we can tell a lot about a person's character by the things they say. A professing Christian once got kind of angry at work, let loose with some profanity, and the words were no sooner out of his mouth, he was embarrassed by what he had said. Turning to a co-worker, he apologized. Man, I don't, I, I don't know why I said that. It really isn't in me. To which the wise co-worker replied, it had to be in you, or it wouldn't have come out of you. Jesus said the words that come out of our mouth originate in our heart. The Bible says we're all going to stand before the Lord and someday give an account to how we live this life. Jesus said more specifically, you must give an account on judgment day for every idle word you speak. The words you say will either acquit you or condemn you. Too often we throw words around Maybe I'm just speaking for myself here, without even thinking sometimes about what we're saying. But every word we say reveals something about us. 
And every word we say has consequences. Preaching this sermon is difficult for me because I know that in the past I've spoken words in anger to my wife and my children that hurt. I know that. And I know there have been times in the past when I tried to be humorous by making light or fun of somebody else's situation, thinking that was funny. And I know there have been times in the past when my, my words were out of line and far too suggestive. And so I know from personal experience what James is saying, what the Bible says about our tongue is true. Our tongue has the ability to produce life or death in other people. And James gives us four examples here to prove his point. He talks about teachers. Teachers are held in high honor in the church, in the Bible, in society as a whole, because students inherently trust and respect their teachers. Students expect that what they're receiving from their teachers is the truth. And so teachers have a huge influence on their students. Fact is, many of us can point to teachers, even that we had years and years ago, though we've forgotten a lot of things, we can point to teachers that we had when we were growing up who had a tremendous influence in our lives, sometimes good and, and sometimes maybe not so good. But that's why James says teachers are going to be held by God to a stricter judgment because they do have so much influence. Pound for pound, a horse is one of the most powerful animals in existence, and yet with just a small bit in the horse's mouth, we can control where that horse goes. Yeah, a young person and an old person alike. Someone who's strong and someone who's not so strong. Even a dog can turn a horse where it desires <laughs> with the use of a small bit. A smaller, weaker individual can, can control that horse. A comparatively small rudder attached to the back of a boat, maybe even a huge ship can steer that ship whatever direction the, the rudder points it. Lucian Mari has once uh, caught a mouse, and uh, while it was still alive, he threw it on a pile of burning leaves outside. That mouse caught fire, ran back into the house, and Mari's helplessly watches his entire house <laughs> burn to the ground. It's said that the devastatingly destructive Chicago fire of 1871 was started by a, a lady named Mrs. O'Leary who was milking a cow in her barn. The cow kicked over a lantern Mrs. O'Leary was using to work by set fire to the hay in the barn. Before the flames were brought under control over two days later, the raging fires wiped out the entire Chicago business district destroyed 17,450 buildings and houses, leaving over 100,000 people homeless, killing more than 300 people. James says that our human tongue is as powerful as a tiny flame of fire, as powerful as a small rudder at the back of a ship, as powerful as a tiny bit in a horse's mouth, as powerful as the influence of a teacher. We still question that. We still wonder if that's really the case. All we need to do is to look back to World War II and see how the three most influential leaders of World War II used their words. Adolf Hitler used words to deceive and destroy many, many millions of people's lives. Winston Churchill and Franklin Roosevelt used words to inspire nations of people to fight for freedom. Words are important, and words are powerful. James tells us the tongue is a powerful poison at times. Some of the best advice in all of the Bible is found in James chapter 1 and verse 19. Unfortunately, it's some of the least heated advice in the Bible as well. Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters, James tells us, 
you must all, all be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry. James is simply saying, we need to listen more, talk less. There are a lot of sins that we commit in life that we can apologize for and make restitution for and ask forgiveness for. But when we say something like, you look fat. You're so stupid. You're ugly. You're no good. We inflict deep wounds in a person's soul that we can never heal or repair, regardless of how hard we try. Trying to smooth over, over the damage of destructive words is going to meet with about the same success as trying to take the toothpaste that we've squeezed out of a tube, words here, words there, and then somehow thinking that we can put it back in the tube. It just isn't going to work. The damage has already been done. Jesus said, you've been told you must not murder or you are subject to God's judgment. I'm telling you that if you call someone an idiot or any other name, or if you curse someone else, you are in danger of going to hell. Jesus is saying that our words can be as destructive as murder itself. And he's not just referring to one name, one word that we might use. Jesus was condemning every kind of language that demeans other people, whoever they are. Because they've been made in his image. I mean, how many times have we heard in the news someone commits suicide because they've been teased over and over again? Maybe it was in person or maybe it was on Facebook. Words hurt. The psalmist said, the venom of a viper drips from the lips of evil people. The proverb author tells us the words of a scoundrel are a destructive blaze. Telling lies about others, the proverb writer said, is as harmful as hitting them with an ax, wounding them with a sword, or shooting them with an arrow. And if you've ever been the victim of someone's vicious words, you know exactly what the proverb writer is saying. It hurts deeply. Regardless of what we say, sticks and stones can break our bones, and words do harm. So the next time we find ourselves being tempted to make ourselves look good by putting someone else down, we need to stop. Just stop. Because mean words cause emotional scars that last a long time. Actions, words, are always accompanied by reactions. What comes out of the mouth originates in the heart. There was a time as a teenager when I used God's name in vain, didn't think anything about it. And I'd cuss at school because I thought it sounded cool at school, and then knew, boy, I better not use those words when I got home. Did any of your parents wash your mouth out with soap when you were a kid? Yeah. 
I'm not the wor world's most intelligent individual, but it, it, it didn't take more than a couple times for me to realize. <laughs> you know, you, you can think you can stop that when you go home, but it, it slips, doesn't it? But having said that, the cure to poisonous talk isn't a bar of soap. It's a changed heart. Not until after I committed my life to Jesus Christ. Not until after I learned what Jesus sacrificed for me and how much God loves me. Not till then did I realize how holy his name is. His name is to be praised. It isn't an adjective to express how angry I am. Not until I started listening to myself. Not until the Holy Spirit began to change my way of thinking did other swear words also lose their appeal. And here's the facts. I know this to be true. Many work in an environment or live in a neighborhood, have family and friends who, who think nothing of the language they use. I, I get that. And truth is, there was a time we probably didn't care much about the language that we used either. Truth is, it's still difficult when we hear that language over and over again not to use it ourselves. I get that. And that's why, as followers of Jesus Christ, we've got to be disciplined. We need to guard the kind of, of television shows or movies that we watch. We need to avoid listening to music or reading books that, that are filled with that kind of bad language because the words that come out of our mouth originate where? In our heart. And that's why Paul told us to think on things above. That's why Paul told us to to read and to listen and think about things that are true and right and pure and noble and praiseworthy and admirable and excellent. That's why we need to fill our minds more and more with the Word of God instead of the words of the world. Because we don't want our words to do the damage they are capable of doing. And there are other ways our words can be damaging. Paul also says, do everything without complaining or arguing or grumbling. Why? Because ultimately our, our complaining and our grumbling reflects more upon God than it does upon people. Paul says, don't use foul or abusive language. Why? Because that kind of language doesn't honor the holy God that we serve. Paul says, get rid of all harsh words. Get rid of slander. Gossip separates the best of friends. Rumors are oftentimes taken by others to be truth. 22 years after President Abraham Lincoln died from an assassin's bullet and was buried, his coffin was dug out of the ground. His body was examined. Now, his body wasn't examined to see if there really was a, a, a bullet there in his body. His body was examined, or it was, his coffin was examined to see if his body was there. You see, the, a rumor had gone around the country that his coffin was empty, that he hadn't really been buried. So a group of witnesses were there as they took the coffin out, as they saw the body in there. These witnesses saw as they resealed the coffin, this time with lead. Do you know 14 years later in the year 1901, his coffin was again dug out of the ground because of the rumors that were going around the country that his coffin was still empty? Rumors are powerful. Words are powerful, whether they are the a rumor or whether they're, they're the truth, whether they're helpful or, or are hurtful. And sometimes our words can be powerfully poisonous. But James also tells us the tongue has positive potential. We all know that to be true. 
When the tongue has such powerful potential for praise and doing good and, and helping others, why would we use it for anything else but for what God intended it to be used for? The Bible says that timely words are like apples of gold and settings of silver. The Bible says we should help others do what is right and build them up in the Lord. The Bible says, let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. The Bible says everyone enjoys a fitting reply. It is wonderful to say the right thing at the right time. I know, man, how powerful a timely and a kind word can be in my life. And that's true in all of our lives. It might be something as simple as, thank you. You have no idea what that meant to me. Something as simple as, I really appreciate you. Something as simple as, you know, your smile lifts me up every time I see it. Something as simple as your example your example inspires me. Or your parents did a great job when they raised you. William Ward was an English preacher who once said, and I quote, flatter me and I may believe you. Criticize me and I may not like you. Ignore me and I may not forgive you. Encourage me, and I will not forget you. Somewhere I heard um, that in Sri Lanka, it was once believed that lizards stored wisdom in their tongues. For the life of me, I can't remember where it was. Maybe it was in a dream, I don't know. But consequently, Sri Lankan parents would feed lizard tongue sandwiches to their children in the hopes, I know, doesn't that sound good? In the hopes their children would grow up to be clever and well-spoken. Now, whether it's true or not, whether it's fact or not, people will learn to use their tongue in a positive way. But God intended it when they observe others doing it. There's something in ourselves being encouraged by somebody's words or observing how they encourage someone else with their words that makes us want to do the same thing. Ann Kimmel Anderson writes in her book entitled Especially for a Woman about her sister Jan who was a third grade teacher. Jan had this bright young man in her a class who was very polite but for whatever reason he wasn't doing very, very well with his grades. One day, Jan looks him right in the eyes, and she says, Rodney, you are very smart. You are a great young man. You have the potential to be one of my brightest, smartest, most successful students. Before she finished her sentence, Rodney blurted out, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Do you know from that moment on, Rodney's papers were neater? His work was better? His grades dramatically improved, all because a teacher intentionally chose to give him a dose of affirmation and encouragement. I am a Christian today, coming up on 42 years of full-time ministry, because a girlfriend and a preacher dared to affirm me when I was a teenager, dared to speak truth and potential into my life that I didn't even realize that I aspired to because they dared to speak those words of truth into my life. We can have that kind of impact on people today by the words that we share with them which are positive and affirming and accepting. When told to quit talking about their faith in Jesus Christ, both Peter and John replied, we cannot help speak about what we have seen and heard. Paul said the only thing, the only thing that mattered in life to him was using his words to testify about the great grace 
of God's love. That ought to be our wish as well. That God would use my tongue to point people to Jesus Christ. As the years have gone by, I've had to pray, God, help me to listen more and talk less. Lord, use my tongue as a messenger of encouragement, not discouragement. Help my words, Lord, to be a reflection of your light instead of Satan's darkness. Use my words to point people to the only word who is life. Jesus Christ. So, that wooden tongue depressor you have there on your seat, take it home, and on one side, I want you to use a a marker to write the words that are found in Psalm chapter 19 and verse 14, which are there on your outline. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Write those words on that. You can use it as a bookmark in your Bible. You can put it on your bathroom mirror, tape it to your refrigerator, put it there on the front of your car, someplace prominent, so every time you see that, you're reminded Lord, may the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be pleasing in your sight, my rock and my redeemer. Let's pray. Lord, I am so blessed by your grace, your patience. And none of us has arrived. None of us is where we need to be. But I just thank you, Jesus, that because of your truth, your sacrifice, power of the Holy Spirit living in me, that I am closer today being what you want me to be than I was a few years ago. And by your grace, I'll be closer tomorrow and closer five years from now than I am today. God, I pray that you would take this entire congregation of people and and God, you would use our words to build up, not to tear down, to encourage, not to discourage. But God, we would not use your name in vain as an adjective when we're angry, but rather we would talk about you in front of those we know in the desire to Help them find what we have found in you. So thank you for inspiring James to write what he did. Thank you for bringing us here today. And God, I pray that uh, uh, the results of our time here will be seen by our family members, by our coworkers, by our fellow students as, uh, God, you change the words that we use and how how we use them. And if there's any good that's accomplished because of our time here, we give you the praise and the glory for that and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.